Well, so welcome everybody to Mission Hospice and Home Care, uh, our community education department. I'm so happy this afternoon to have Hank Dunn with us. This is a um, repeat. Uh, he spoke in the fall for um, a, a wonderful group of our community uh, about advanced care planning and difficult decision making at end of life. And there was uh, a number of people that asked after that talk for information specific to um, the spiritual and emotional and sort of ethical concerns that people find themselves in while they are making decisions about end of life care. So welcome to you all. My name is Susan Barber. I'm the direct, the manager of the community education program at Mission Hospice and Home Care. And we are a small not-for-profit community-based hospice program in San Mateo County. We serve San Mateo and Northern Santa Clara County. And for those of you not from our um, service area, we are non-affiliated and a not-for-profit hospice. That means we're not part of any large hospital system. We're not part of a larger healthcare system. We were founded by two women in our community 42 years ago. One of those women became our very first patient in 1979. And since that time, we've served thousands of people in San Mateo and Northern Santa Clara County. And for those that are not familiar with the Bay Area, that is the area between San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And so we serve a very rural population out in the farmlands of the, um, of the coast. And then we also serve a very sophisticated uh, group of folks that are working in Silicon Valley and living here. So welcome to you all, no matter where you're coming from. If you would um, be so kind in the chat, maybe just to put up where you're Zooming in from. And if there's any kind of intention or question that you have that uh, brought you here today, we're going to um, introduce Hank in just a minute. And I wanna just say at the end of this talk, I'm going to be looking for two volunteers that might be willing to stay afterwards and just record a short two or three minute um, reflection on um, this particular offering and uh, if it was a value and how you found this valuable. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting to say something, but what I want to say next is I'm so grateful to Hank Dunn. Um, Hank joined us for an event uh, last last summer, I think it was, and I saw his name and I thought, oh, he's so familiar. Maybe he's one of our volunteers or perhaps he's this person or that person. And then I realized in an exchange of email with Hank that um, we use his book, Hard Choices for Loving People, which has sold over 4 million copies right now, um, possibly more since the last time I looked at that number. And we've used it um, for our volunteers and also we with um, our community ambassadors, uh, one of whom is here today helping me with this, Barbara Lemper. Those are volunteers for Mission Hospice that are trained specifically in um, community education. And so I thank Barbara for her support today and any of the other community ambassadors that may be here. But we, do a, we did a training with a group of community ambassadors um, in 2019 so they could be peer counselors for folks trying to get their advanced care planning done and Hank's book Hard Choices for Loving People was the gift we gave them all so I was a little embarrassed when I didn't realize that six months later when he showed up in our event but Hank was going to be speaking with you all um, he has worked uh, sort of across the board, he's worked in care facilities, he's worked in hospital settings, he's worked with hospice patients, and as a chaplain, um, an author, and a teacher, he spends a lot of time talking with people about what's most of value to them, what's most important, um, so that they can live their life as closely aligned with their values and the things that they treasure. Um, up until their last breath, and that is very much aligned with the work we do at Mission Hospice, where our um, our motto is it's about life, and we really believe that this is about life up until the person's last breath. So, Hank, I'm going to put the spotlight on you, and I'm going to turn this over to you. And thank you all so very much for being here today. And thank you so much for those of you that are putting this up in the chat. And I am going to mute myself, and we are going to mute all of you until there's a chance. I want to just say two things. I'm sorry that I didn't earlier, that we are going to ask um, if people have questions, we will have a Q&A. Uh, section at the end of this and you can ask during the uh, during Hank's presentation if you have a question you can open up the chat by going to the bottom or top of your screen and clicking on either the chat button or those three little buttons that, and chat will come up and just put your question in the chat and we can relay that to Hank at the end of his presentation and if it's a kind of private question that you don't want everybody to be reading when you go to the chat instead of directing it to everybody if you click the down arrow you can see my name, Susan Barber, and you can just send that to me and we will ask it as anonymously as is possible. So thank you so much, Hank, and carry on. 
thank you for having me, Susan. Um, she asked if I could say a little bit about myself, who I am before I do the screen share. Uh, I have been a hospice, a nursing home, hospital chaplain for over 40 years, or around 40 years, come think of it. Um, when I first got into nursing home work, I was a nursing home chaplain first, I had very little experience with death and dying. And those precious elderly folks at the nursing home taught me so much. And um, I'll, I'll tell you some about that during my talk today. But I um, found out a lot about uh, the spiritual, emotional issues. Uh, I'm, you know, a trained minister, but they taught us precious little about death and dying in seminary. <laughs> taught us about preaching, running a church, things like that, but not too much about real life. So I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share, and I have slides. And what the plan is, is that we will... Um, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes or so, 45 minutes to an hour, and then I'll give us uh, half an hour to 45 minutes for um, questions and discussion. And I really welcome all of you to, to share your experience. I like to say all of you who are here today are your own experts in the emotional, spiritual issues at the end of life. All of us have been touched by death and grief at some point in our life and uh, we've learned something and we took away our own emotional and spiritual issues and I um, I welcome you to add to my list I'm going to give you a list of seven emotional spiritual issues that I've identified but they're not an exhaustive list and uh, it's just my list and you can add your own I'll start with a story that became a metaphor for me um, as Susan mentioned, I, um, my book, The Hard Choices for Loving People book, is about helping patients and families make end-of-life decisions, things like CPR and feeding tubes and stuff like that. And this lady here, she was a volunteer at the nursing home where I work, and I, I tell this story with her permission. Uh, I was... Um, going through some old newsletters at the nursing home where I used to work and I ran across this picture of her. So uh, uh, she had found these birds that had evidently fallen out of a bird's nest at her house and she was nurturing them, hopefully, to life. And uh, she brought them into the nursing home one day to show us. So that's why this picture with her, those little birds. But Jerry came in on a Monday morning and she says, Hank, I've got to make a life and death decision about my mother by Thursday. And, and she starts to cry as she's telling me this. And I said, well, let, let's find where we can talk. So we got a little privacy. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. And she said, well, mom's in a hospital down in Virginia Beach, which is about a three hour drive from where we were in Northern Virginia. She said, mom's in the hospital. And she's on dialysis. And my brothers and sisters and I, we have to make a decision whether to take her off dialysis and let her die. And I said, well, tell me a little bit more about it. Has, has she been sick for a long time or just all of a sudden has gone into kidney failure? And she says, oh gosh, she's been sick for a long time. She's had two strokes in the last two years and things are shutting down. And now, now the kidneys are shutting down. She's on dialysis. And I said, well, what do the docs say? Is the treatment doing any good? And she said, oh, they don't think it's doing any good at all. And then she said, um, and then I said to her, well, did your mother ever give any indication what she would have wanted done in a situation like this? And she said, oh, yeah, mom said she never wanted to be on dialysis. <laughs> and I said, Jerry, this is not a hard decision. I said, of course you take your mother off dialysis for all the reasons you just have given me, that this is the end of a long decline in her health. Um, the docs say it's not doing any good. Your mom said she didn't want to be on dialysis. Of course you take her off. And then I said to her, what's going on here that makes this so difficult? And at that point, she started to cry. And she says, I think I'm feeling guilty because I haven't visited mom enough. 
Well, when she mentioned guilt, I knew she was moving into my area. I know us Baptists seem to think we have more guilt than the rest of you guys, but then of course there's the famous Catholic guilt and Jewish guilt. Um, but the guilt, she was really needing to talk about forgiveness, forgiving herself, forgiving, uh, looking for God's forgiveness if that was an issue for her. Well, this I uh, mentioned became a metaphor for me because I came up with what I call uh, Hank's theorems. By the way, in the handouts that uh, I think Susan made available to you, if you have those, the PDF of it, this, these theorems are at the end. Now, this is, I think, the only one I'm going to share with you this lecture, that, but I, I did on my other lecture on end of life decisions, hit most of those other theorems. But um, Jerry's experience, my experience with Jerry, kind of gave me this as one of my theorems. For patients and families, end of life decisions have little to do with medicine, law, ethics, religion, or morality. For them, the decisions are almost wholly em emotional and spiritual in their nature. Now, these decisions, they do have, you know, a heck of a lot to do with medicine, with law, ethics, morality, and religion here, as opposed to spiritual down here, I mean, like um, your, your religious group, um, for greatest example of that is Jehovah's Witness, they don't do uh, blood transfusions, that's just their religion. And they literally would rather die than get a blood transfusion. So that would be the example of, of religion. Whereas spiritual are the questions that all of us ask. What's the meaning of my life? Can I be forgiven? Those types of things. So what Jerry was dealing with was, was an emotional, spiritual issue. She was worried that maybe she hadn't visited mom or not, her mom enough. And now she's keeping her mom on dialysis because she was feeling guilty. So this is um, where I'm gonna where I start when uh, these end of life decisions. But uh, as we look at this whole summary now of the spo spiritual and emotional concerns at the end of life, this is my list. And as I indicated, all of you are your own experts about the spiritual and emotional concerns at the end of life. Um, some of this is based on a lot of research. Some of it is just my experience over the 40 years or so that I've been doing this work. So here's my list. And I'll, if you're writing this down, you don't have those handouts in front of you. Uh, I'll come back to this slide seven times or six more times after this. What's the meaning of my life? Seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. Gaining a sense that what is happening is okay. Letting be. Gaining a sense of being part of a greater whole, it's often expressed as living beyond death. Coming to terms with the denial of death. Letting go of all I've worked for over a lifetime, my possessions, my career, my family, and even, or maybe especially, the letting go of the self, the ego. And lastly, coming to terms with the loss of control. So let me talk about what is the meaning of my life as the first of these spiritual emotional concerns? Um, if you, uh, I won't take the time to show this video, but um, you can go to YouTube. Uh, and this is a TED talk given by this EMT, Matthew O'Reilly. It's entitled, Am I Dying? And he had this uh, a great short five minute talk that he gave about him encountering people at accident scenes and they would ask him am i dying am i dying and he tells a story that i would always tell oh no we're gonna we're gonna do everything we can to save you even though he knew they were gonna die they weren't gonna make it and he decided to change one day and told somebody yes you are dying and people started telling him what's most important to them and this is his list that he came up what people were looking for he said there are three patterns and cases where people are told they're going to die. One is the need for forgiveness. Two, a need for remembrance, need that they feel they would be living on, need for immortality. And three, the dying need to know that their life had meaning. One of the classic books about this whole idea of 
uh, the meaning of life and um, this being so important to us humans. Viktor Frankl, who uh, was a survivor of the death camps during the Second World War, Jewish man, a psychiatrist. And so he's in these uh, camps and he's observing his own behavior, the behavior of the guards, the behavior of the other inmates. And he asked the question, can man, can woman have meaning in such a horrible place as this? And his answer is yes, they can. And so he wrote um, this book, Man's Search for Meaning. We'll excuse him. He did write in the 1940s and 50s. So the sexist language was what it was like in that day. But we can just translate this man's or woman's search for meaning. But he talked about the, the, the importance of seeking meaning. Man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or to avoid pain, but rather to see a meaning in his life. That is why man is even ready to suffer on the condition, to be sure, that his suffering has a meaning. The second thing I want to look at just briefly is seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. I um, borrowed this from Dr. Bayak, Ira Bayak. He's written several books. And uh, in one of his books, or maybe it was a video I saw of him, he would ask patients. Uh, he's a hospice doctor. He says, if you were to die today, God forbid, but if you were to die today, is there anything that would be left undone? In his experience, and it has been my experience too, uh, one of the things people often say is being left undone is reconciling with other people or needing a sense of forgiveness of themselves. He had four important statements, four things that matter most that he put in a book with the same title. He says, please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. And I love you. That's his summary of what's most important. Uh, this wonderful book, Lewis Smeads and the Art of Forgiving, I'm just going to give you, and again, this is in your handouts if you want to look at it. Uh, forgiving happens in three stages. We discover the humanity of the person who wronged us. We surrender our right to get even, and we wish that person well. Waiting for someone to repent before we forgive is to surrender our future to the person who wronged us. Um, this is especially important for people who are, are dying and they wish somebody would, would say they're sorry and come to them and, and ask for forgiveness and they don't do it. Or especially if the person's already died, how can you get them to say they're sorry? So forgiveness is really um, what happens in your own heart. Uh, Smeeds goes on, forgiving is not a way to avoid pain, but to heal pain. We do not excuse the person we forgive. We blame the person we forgive. Forgiving is essential. Talking about it is optional. In other words, you don't have to confront the person and say, I forgive you, because they might not want forgiveness. Forgiveness is in our own heart. And as uh, has summarized, when we forgive, we set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner we set free is us. The third summary, uh, third thing that I, I feel is important is gaining a sense that what is happening is okay, what I call moving to letting be. Um, you'll recognize this on other uh, schemes people talk about acceptance. Uh, this was a great quote from Flannery O'Connor, a great Southern writer. Um, she suffered with lupus for 13 years before she died, the same disease that killed her father when she was a teenager. But she concluded this about her suffering and her sickness. She said, I've never been anywhere but sick. In a sense, sickness is a place more instructive than a long trip to Europe. And it's always a place where there's no company, where nobody can follow. Sickness before death is a very appropriate thing. And I think those who don't have it miss one of God's mercies. Now I 
personally would never say this to a patient or someone who's going through sickness. Uh, so I, I actually put this quote the last time I revised my book to the seventh edition, I put this quote in, so I'll let her say it because she's a person who has gone through that um, suffering and tells about the mercy that she has discovered from that. I do wanna tell you how I learned about this from my own father. I'll tell you just a quick summary of his life. He started out as a newspaper reporter, then moved to managing editor of the Tampa Daily Times in Tampa, Florida. He served uh, two years as a TV a newscaster in Miami, and he happened to be on the NBC affiliate there when Castro had taken over in uh, Cuba, and they sent dad down with uh, John Chancellor and others to, to report. And this is a picture of my dad in the car right in front of the tank where Fidel Castro was coming in. It was one of the highlights of his TV career. He then uh, left TV and went to uh, work at AAA in Tampa and retired his day job at age 70 and went back doing TV work for two minutes a week. He did a little spotlight in Tampa. Dad was a historian by um, a popular historian and he wrote about 18 books on Florida history, most of them photography books, old photographs. And he did this and, um, for a while, but he, Parkinson's and stroke just got to him and he ended up in a nursing home. Uh, this is one of the pictures when he was a nursing home child, but I call that photo of myself. Uh, that's uh, uh, one of the, um, <laughs> my mustache the other day, that's a, my John Bolton look. But dad was in a nursing home and we picked dad up one time at the nursing home and uh, I was, driving and my mom and my nephew were in the back seat and we're driving in Tampa, the Tampa suburbs and got stuck at this traffic light. And across the street is this old historic lookout tower for forest fires. And from the back seat, mom said, your dad did a TV spot from that corner. And my dad corrected her. He says, I did several. So the light is still red and we're across the street from this uh, historic site. And I said to dad, dad, when was that tower last used as a fire lookout tower? And dad uh, is thinking and he's thinking and he's looking through that brain of his that's damaged by Parkinson's and strokes and he could not find the date. Dates were important to dad and he couldn't come up with a date. And he finally turned to me with this big grin on his face and he says it doesn't matter and I thought well gosh it's true it doesn't matter it would have mattered to him another time but it didn't matter anymore and dad had gotten to the place of this what I call the spot of letting be and I wrote a poem I first put it in um my uh, 2001 edition of Hard Choices for Loving People. And the title was Giving Up and Letting Go. And I got to thinking more, you know, there's maybe another step from letting go to letting be. So I redid the poem and added another stanza to it. And uh, uh, another line on each stanza. And it goes like this. Giving up implies a struggle. Letting go implies a partnership. Letting be implies in reality, there's nothing that separates. Giving up says there is something to lose. Letting go says there's something to gain. Letting be says it doesn't matter. Giving up dreads the future. Letting go looks forward to the future. Letting be accepts the present as the only moment I ever have. Giving up lives out of fear. Letting go lives out of grace and trust. Letting be just lives. Giving up is defeat at the hands of suffering. Letting go is victory over suffering. Letting be knows suffering is often in my own mind in the first place. Giving up is unwillingly yielding control to forces beyond myself. Letting go is choosing to yield to forces beyond myself. Letting be acknowledges that control and choices can be illusions. 
Giving up believes that God is to be feared. Letting go, trust in God to care for me. Letting be, never ask the question. And as I mentioned, um, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about getting to the point of acceptance. And that's what this is at this point. The letting be is moving toward acceptance. Fourth thing, gaining a sense of being part of a greater whole. Often people express this as living beyond the grave. I was passing through the uh, airport in uh, Atlanta, Georgia one time, and I saw this sign that says, just passing through, aren't we all? And this was by the people who did the chapel there at the, at the airport. Um, this was a survey, and I'll actually picked out some of what the percent of people in the United States who believe in heaven of a whole population, about 72% believe in heaven. Protestants, about 86%, and it goes from 88 evangelicals, 93% for historic black Catholics, about 85%. Mormons at 95, Jehovah's Witness at 50%. Jewish folks at 40, Muslims 89, Buddhists 47. And look here, even atheists, about 5% believe in heaven. Agnostics, about 14%. People who are, um, religion is not important to them. They're no, uh, they, they don't claim any religion. They have about 32% of them um, believe in heaven. And those who say religion is important to them, about 72%. Uh, I tell this just because to, I show this just because I wanted to show how um, pervasive the belief in heaven is. This was a story about the Neanderthals, and there are, uh, uh, we actually, uh, they were over here. We came this way. They're our cousins. We didn't descend from the Neanderthals, but many of the paleontologists and looking at um, Neanderthal graves believe that they buried their dead with um, rituals to have a sense that we had, they had a sense that life went on after the grave. I say basically there's two views of what happens after death. Some have a sense that living, um, uh, living a wonderful life beyond the grave, and some have a sense that this wonderful life is all there is. Uh, I won't take a lot of time to talk about the idea of living after death, the scripture, you know, the 23rd Psalm, uh, those who have been to Christian funerals will know, uh, recognize these. Do not let your heart be troubled. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Um, this is, uh, of course, Christian um, and uh, in, in Jewish sense, as I mentioned, the Muslims too. Um, these scriptures uh, a lot talk about life after death. On the other side, there's a lot of folks who just believe this wonderful life is all there is. Um, Irvin Yalom, who was a um, psychotherapist and uh, known for his group work, says life is a spark between two identical voids, the darkness before birth and the one after death. Uh, Epicurus said, why should I fear death? If I am, death is not. If death is, I am not. Why should I fear that which cannot exist when I do? Mark Twain, I do not fear death. I've been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. And even in scripture, there's some emphasis about um, the wonderfulness of life here. The kingdom of God is among you. Um, this is a great, you can um, find this, go to the um, PBS website and you can watch this film, Into the Night. And it talked, to a lot of people uh, talked about their experience, both people who believe in uh, living after death or those who do not. And um, this is Caitlin Doty, um, great writer. She wrote, when I'm dead, I'm dead. And I just sail into nothingness and that brings me a lot of comfort doesn't bring everyone comfort but it brings me comfort and in this film also astrophysicist um adam frank 
talked about the vastness of the universe. And he says, science is a gateway to a sense of awe. I know many people look at the stars and feel a sort of existential terror of being absolutely alone in a meaningless universe. And I, I don't understand that at all. Just because the cosmic drama is large doesn't mean that my place in it is any less significant. In fact, it makes me feel a part of this vast drama like I absolutely belong in the universe. Um, my point is here, um, not that you have to believe in life after death. I think uh, I've seen a lot of people who think this life is all there is, have very, very peaceful deaths. And that, as Caitlin Doty mentions, it brings me a lot of comfort. And why it brings people comfort is they've saw, they've settled this issue. Um, some, like I said, are helped by the idea of living on and seeing their loved ones. And as a chaplain, it's my role not to convince you one way or the other. Um, I'm there to help you find your own spirituality. The fifth issue or concern, uh, emotional, spiritual issues that in life, end of life, is coming to terms with the denial of death. And I got a couple cartoons I'd like to start with here. There's a woman, obviously a widow, dragged her doctor or her husband's doctor out to his grave in the snow and he's got a stethoscope on the ground and the doc says, I'm afraid there's really very little I can do. Here are three um, grim reapers out for a walk and one of them drops over dead. And the other one says to the other, you never think it's going to happen to you. So this, I wanna talk about the denial of death. This was a classic book written by uh, Ernest Becker in the early 1970s. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, great book. It is very dense reading. It's not an easy read, but he's just got some wonderful gems in there. And he talked about death anxiety. He said, the idea, idea of death, the fear of it haunts the human animal like nothing else. It's a mainspring of human activity. Activity designed largely to avoid the final, fatality of death. To overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny for man. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams tells, quotes her mother, who was dying and her mom told her, Terry, dying doesn't cause suffering. Resistance to dying causes suffering. Frank Ostaseski, um, and I know he's a fr friend of uh, Mission Hospice there. He um, says, uh, I cannot be free if I am rejecting any part of my experience. We waste our energy and exhaust ourselves with the insistence that life can be otherwise. In other words, he's saying to, to deny death is to be resistant to what is happening to us. I'm getting, uh, I'm hearing some sound. Is that, is that me, uh, Susan, or somebody out there? It may be me. I just looked and saw my mic was off, Hank, so it's possible. Okay, I don't know. I think it's gone now. Um, Eddie Hillisom, she was a Jewish woman in Amsterdam writing at the same time that Anne Frank was writing her diaries. She was writing in diaries and writing letters to friends about her experience under the Nazi occupations. She wrote uh, journals, she wrote letters. Um, she wanted to be intentional about what was happening to her. She lived in this uh, row house and wrote in that um, second floor window up there. She talked about looking out on the street here in Amsterdam. And this sign was there. And I, when I was there visiting, I had a uh, Dutch friend translate it for me. In this house, Eddie Hillison wrote her journals, 1941 and 42. She eventually went to um, the uh, concentration camp uh, outside of Amsterdam it's called Westerbork. And that was where they stayed for months and months. 
and the train just started coming in and taking folks from there to Auschwitz. So she was there and continuing to write letters and write in her journals and was able to get these out to friends and family because she wanted to tell everybody what was happening to her and how she was processing all this. But one of the things that um, I feel tells, uh, she talks about this denial of death, she wrote, wrote this. The reality of death has become a definite part of me. My life has, so to speak, been extended by death. By my looking death in the eye and accepting it, by accepting destruction as part of life and no longer wasting my energies on fear of death or refusal to acknowledge its inevitability. It sounds paradoxical. By excluding death from our life, we cannot live a full life. And by admitting death into our life, we enlarge and enrich it. I had this um, patient one time in hospice. He, um, we were told before we went to the house to take off our hospice pins. The patient was a man and his wife didn't want him to know that he was a hospice patient. And so um, I dutifully took my pin off when I was out in the car and walked into the house and met with the wife and she and I sat in the living room. The patient was in the back room and uh, he was very close to dying. As a matter of fact, uh, he was just in a, a couple days from dying. Um, but anyway, uh, so I'm talking with the wife and she's talking very matter of factly about her husband dying and that it's not gonna be much longer and um, talked about their life and how wonderful a marriage they had. And so I asked her, I says, what's this about um, us taking off your, uh, these, our hospice pins? Does your husband know he's dying? And she says, oh yeah, he knows he's dying. And I said, well, how do you know he knows he's dying? And she said, well, he asked me one day. And I said, well, what'd you tell him? And she says, oh, I told him not while I'm around. And I said to her, what if you had said to him, yeah, you are dying and I'm gonna miss you greatly. You've been a great husband. We've traveled and we have kids and grandkids and um, you've provided and it's, it's been a wonderful life. What if you had said something like that? Just, oh, I couldn't do that. That would be too hard. Well, she's right, it is hard to say things like that. Uh, but I think it gets at what Eddie Hillison is saying is by admitting death into our life, we enlarge and enrich it. And by excluding it, where she didn't allow this conversation to have, um, it made the, her life smaller. So that's getting beyond the denial of death. The next thing, is letting go of all I've worked for over a lifetime. That is possessions, career, family, even letting go of the ego, the self, which is what I'm gonna talk about most here. As I indicated, I was a nursing home chaplain, meeting a lot of these old folks. And I was um, really surprised. I had never done a lot of extensive work. I'd visited earlier years in, my, in the ministry, I would visit people in the hospital occasionally and the nursing home occasionally. But now that I was doing it, you know, 40 hours a week, every day working with old folks and dying folks, I was learning a heck of a lot from them. And one of the surprises I had when I was a nursing home chaplain was just how easy these folks talked about um, dying. And, um, it was obviously mostly old people, very disabled people, but there were a lot of younger folks too. And they got to be kind of that matter of fact and just how um, they were, some of them were even looking forward to dying. They were tired of living. So I've started thinking a lot about the spiritual aspects of dying for all of us, whether you're religious or not, it has nothing to do with religion. And this book, has been immensely helpful to me in uh, understanding what's going on. Kathleen Dowling Singh wrote The Grace 
and dying, how we are transformed spiritually as we die. And basically her thesis is that, uh, and this is transpersonal psychology is what she's teaching here. The thesis is, is that we all um, are transformed spiritually as we die. Uh, interestingly, um, she died a couple of years ago um, after writing this book and a number of other books on the same kind of theme of being transformed with, uh, with grace. But this is kind of her, uh, one of her summaries of what's happening with the ego, the self. And she says, in a sense, it is not so much just that the prognosis of a terminal disease is a tragedy, but that the integration of the news of the prognosis reveals our tragic state. Stephen Levine speaks of the fear of death as the imagined loss of imagined individuality. One woman dying of cancer referred to her disease as a process and the process of dying as an egoectomy. This is, um, uh, Reading this book, Eric Casal talked about what uh, suffering as opposed to pain, pain being the acutely unpleasant physical discomfort experienced by someone who is violently struck, injured, or ill in certain ways. Suffering is the state of severe distress associated with events that threaten the intactness of person. So it's this loss of this person that we have created. I was in a um, arts festival in Crested Butte, Colorado one time, and I saw this drawing. Uh, this artist was selling these drawings there at his um, booth. And he titled this, uh, putting it together, and it's of his two-year-old son who was trying to figure out who he was as a two-year-old. And I saw this and I immediately thought, oh man, this is why we have a hard, such a hard time dying, is that we take our life, our whole life, putting together who we are. And at the end of life, we have to let go of it and take it. Uh, it's, it's being taken apart again. The self that we created, we're having to say goodbye to it. Uh, I told the artist, I said, I got a great idea for another uh, drawing you could do of an old person in a bed. And they're taking the pieces of the puzzle and putting them back in the box. And he says, oh, no, I don't want to do that. That's too de de um, depressing. So anyway, um, there's been a lot written about the development of the self and the ego. And uh, Sogo Repache uh, writes, why do we live in such terror of death? Perhaps the deepest reason why we are afraid of death is that we do not know who we are. We believe in a personal, unique, and separate identity. But if we dare to examine it, we find that this identity depends entirely upon an endless collections of things to prop it up. Our name, our biography, our partners, family, um, credit cards, friends. It is on their fragile and transient support that we rely for our security. So when they're all taken away, what will we have? Will we have any idea of who we really are? Now back to Kathleen Singh, and this uh, chart is in your handout. Um, this is a summary, basically, of um, transpersonal psychology, which is what Kathleen Singh teaches in that. And I'm just going to give you the briefest of overview of it. This is we are born. We live our life and we die. We come out of the ground of being. Some people would call that God, but we come out undifferentiated. We develop a person, this identity project. We develop the mental ego. In the mystical traditions, sometimes they call this the false self. Uh, Ernest Becker talked about the character armor. So we become a healthy adult. This is our job is, is to become healthy persons. But we have to let go of this as we start dying. We get in what they call the transpersonal realms. Meditation can help us with that, or we'll get a terminal disease that's gonna help us with that. And we move toward the path of return and to letting be. So that is a summary of what transpersonal psychology is, and Kathleen Seen um, teaches about that. One of the things that, um, this teaches about the illusion is that we're no longer connected to this ground of being. We develop this healthy ego and we're not connected 
to the ground of being, or some people would say to God. Uh, we had this friend in our family who was dying of cancer and he was in, in hospice and everybody knew it. And um, we finally got a text from my brother-in-law and the text said, John is now with God. And my daughter and I immediately, when we read that or, or, or my wife read it to us, we looked at each other and said, isn't that sad that they didn't have a sense he was with God the whole time? but he's now with God only that he died. So um, that's, I think, one of the great teachings of this transpersonal psychology. So I was speaking in Tucson, Arizona in 2002, and I was really struggling as I was coming to this understanding of the um, illusion of the self and letting go of the ego and that we don't really exist. And I was uh, talked about my own struggle as a, as a Christian uh, with this idea, because we do a lot associate uh, the idea of the illusion of the self with Eastern, more Eastern thought. And a woman came up to me at the end of the day when I was speaking, and she said, um, I don't think you're going to be able to hold on to your Christian metaphor anymore. And it kind of made me sad. So I went on a journey I bought this Bible, the one-year Bible, and I read through the Bible in a year looking for this idea of the illusion of the self. And I took notes in the back of the Bible, and I just found it everywhere, this idea that the self is an illusion. Uh, I will tell you that I have this disclaimer, which is also in your um, handouts, that um, I think the scriptures definitely teach that there is a self that goes on and lives forever. Um, that is the predominant teaching. But I think that's actually um, proves the larger point. The fact that so many people believe that we are um, substantial and that we live on, the writings that found their way into scriptures uh, just assume that to start with, even though it is taught the other way um, that the self is an illusion, and I think Jesus taught that. Um, this was this is in your hand. I'm going to go and skip over this. Is uh, Ernest Becker? He did talk about uh, what was going on in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Becker himself called himself a secular Jew, but he grew up with the understanding of uh, uh, in the Hebrew Scriptures. In other words, he says the final terror of self-consciousness, that is the eating of the knowledge of good and evil, the, the fruit of the good, knowledge of good and evil, is the knowledge of one's own death, which is peculiar, the peculiar sentence on man alone in the animal kingdom. This is the meaning of the Garden of Eden myth, that the rediscovery of modern psychology and the rediscovery of modern psychology, that death is man's peculiar and greatest anxiety. So where in the scripture do I see this about the illusion of the self? Um, this out of the Hebrew scriptures, as they came from their mother's womb, so shall they go again, naked as they came, they shall take nothing for their toil, which they may carry away with their hands. Um, now we usually think of this, of course, as material possessions. We're not going to take any of those with us into the afterlife. But what about the self that we created, that we came into this life without a self and we created it. And we're gonna to have to let it go again, as the scripture says. Um, Jesus taught this, those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. Paul the apostle, for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. My mother gave me, uh, my grandmother gave me a Bible when I was 11 years old, and I had marked a passage of scripture that I'm going to give you right now. This was um, my, my Bible from when I was um, 11 years old, and I marked this sometime in my teenage years, and this is the scripture. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, I paraphrase this. There is not an I who lives, 
a Christ. Uh, the Christian mystics taught this. Thomas Merton, writing in his journal, wrote, as long as I continue to take myself seriously, uh, how can I become a saint, a contemplative? As long as I consider, continue to bother myself, what happiness is possible? What happiness is possible in life? For the self that I bother about doesn't really exist and never did, never will, and never did, except in my own imagination. Uh, the Muslim mystic Rumi, what is the mirror of being? Non-being. Always bring a mirror of non-existence as a gift. Any other present is foolish. And uh, this is uh, David Cooper, Rabbi Cooper, talks about it in his book, Ecstatic Kabbalah. When we fully realize the presence, realize the all-consuming nature of presence, we release our sense of self and all of its encumbrances. This is the point of liberation. There is only presence, the oneness. Thus the actual experience might be stated, presence is all there is. This is it. Uh, Thomas Keating, I'm gonna skip over this. This is another Christian contemplative that he talks about that. And I'll move to an atheist who talks about the same thing. And uh, uh, Sam Harris uh, talks about a trip he made to the Holy Land. And he's up on the mount that they think Jesus gave the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And he writes, this happened one afternoon on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, atop the mount where Jesus is believed to have preached his most famous sermon. As I gazed at the surrounding hills and a feeling of peace came over me, it soon, soon grew to a blissful stillness that silenced my thoughts. In an instance, the sense of being a separate self, an I or me, vanished. So kind of in summary, in my own view of this as a um, Christian, uh, I talk about uh, we individually uh, in the species, we're infinitely small, but we're infinitely are large also. This is the um, welcome screen on my phone. <laughs> this is a picture from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Ultra Deep Field. In this photo that was taken over several months, they figure in there, there's 10,000 galaxies. Each one of those galaxies has millions and millions of stars. John Muir said, the world, we are told, was made especially for humans, a presumption not supported by all the facts. Uh, the third thing I th think is a takeaway, matter matters. Our bodies do matter. This is, our bodies are real. We're real inside these bodies. And this uh, body I exist in, I exist for these years I'm on this earth and this body is very important. The Christian message is one of God's presence and transformation now. And this takes the, uh, this view takes dying to self, which you hear a lot of Christians talking about very seriously, dying of the self. So the last thing I wanna talk about um, as we think about the things people struggle with as they approach the end of life or are caring for those who are at the end of life, is coming to terms with the loss of control. Um, this idea of the child figuring out who he is, he's gaining control over his world. This is my grandson and from years ago, and I got to figuring he loved to bang on the piano because I sense as he was learning that his actions have an impact on the world around him. He can hit those keys and a noise came out of the piano. He was gaining control over his world. Uh, this was a discussion about the Neanderthals who buried their dead with ceremonies. They believed that they could appeal to these forces through proper practices and to some extent control them. Um, Ernest Becker talked about control. This is what the child does as he's growing. He's learning to control his life. 
Um, you start looking for control and you're gonna see it everywhere. I went to the grocery store one time and someone had left a post-it note on the, um, in the uh, cart, the grocery cart, <laughs> number one on the list was take control. Uh, you're gonna see this in advertising. This was a postcard a friend of mine got, it said control, you've got it. And that was for Jenny Craig. Um, this was from years ago, a ladies home journal talks about getting organized. What? Get control. Uh, this was um, a frequent flyer program of mine. Benefits that put you in control. Control um, is something we humans do and it's very important. And there's nothing wrong with trying to be in control. And I like this far side cartoon where these two cavemen have killed this big mammoth with that little bitty arrow up there in that one spot. And one caveman says to the other, maybe we should write that spot down. And this was control of how learning how to control our environment. But it comes over into healthcare. And this is um, a Catholic nun, Elaine Prevola. She wrote an article in this issue of Weavings years ago. And she says, the idol of control holds out to hope holds out to us the hope that suffering and death can be eliminated. If we just get smart enough, we can gain control of pain and even death. And that false hope in turn has the effect of setting up suffering as an enemy to be avoided at all costs. We can choose never to suffer. And it comes over into healthcare and Charles Schulz, as he was in the hospital dying of cancer, he told his friend, fellow cartoonist Lynn Johnstone who came to visit him. He said, isn't it amazing how we have no control over our real life? You control all these characters and the lives they live. You decide when they get up in the morning and when they're gonna fight with their friends and when they're gonna lose the game. But your real life, you have no control over. And this is the same guy that gave us this. Charlie Brown in bed, he says, sometimes I lie awake at night and I ask, why me? Then a voice answers, nothing personal. Your name just happened to come up. This was a great play and it was turned into a movie that you could probably access somewhere online. Wit, and it's a story of this woman who was terminally ill and she was fighting her disease and she finally realized she's losing this battle and this exchange with the nurse, the terminally old page says, I can't figure things out. I'm in a quandary having these doubts. And the nurse says to her, what you're doing is very hard. And the patient says, hard things are what I like best. It's not the same, the nurse says. It's like it's out of control, isn't it? And the patients began crying and she says, I'm scared. It was the suggestion that it's out of control. Um, in Oregon, Washington, California, and several other states now, um, people have the option to have uh, medical aid in dying. In Oregon, they call it the Death with Dignity Act, and um, they do a report in Oregon every year, and uh, also the state of Washington has a report. Um, uh, I, I did look, by the way, for the California report. They didn't include the statistics I'm just getting ready to give you out of both Oregon and Washington. And one of the questions in Oregon and Washington, they asked physicians, why did these um, patients choose to have medical aid in dying? The number one reason in um, these states was the fear of losing autonomy, basically the fear of loss of control. Very close to it, um, that the patients were less able to engage in activities that make life enjoyable. And then you can see the other um, issues that they come with, come uh, realize uh, people having the loss of dignity. Pain control is not a high one. It's down here or near the bottom. Financial concerns were very low in what uh, the concerns that people have. This was a study done in Oregon a few years after um, people, they had started uh, me medical aid and died in, in Oregon. And one of the conclusions of this study 
Uh, why do individuals request a legal prescription? The theme of control was predominant in the physician's, physician's description of why their patients requested assisted suicide. Having or being in control was a lifelong value and philosophy of these individuals. Daniel Callahan wrote about this idea of control at the end of life and trying to control um, everything. And he writes this, self-respect and integrity need not and ideally ought not to be grounded in a capacity to control our lives and mortality. What has come to count too much is that our choices affect outcomes in the world. and We are at sea when we cannot do so. Modern medicine and the modern temperament reject solving problems of illness and death by adopting <clears throat> an interior stance of acceptance, <clears throat> choosing extent, instead action and domination. Our capacity to act, to do something is cherished, something preferably affecting the outer world of nature rather than the inner world of the self. We do ourselves a great and double harm by focusing on the meaning of self-determination and the shaping of a self, our capacity to make external choices, to act. Rumi, again, the Muslim mystic wrote, don't listen to your attachment to um, being in blood ties and desires and comforting habits. They seem to protect, but they imprison. They are your worst enemies. They make you afraid of living in emptiness. I've paraphrased this. Don't listen to your desires for grasping and controlling. They seem to protect, but they imprison. They are, they are your worst enemies. They make you afraid of living in emptiness. They make you afraid of dying. And we'll talk about the um, serenity prayer, but I've picked this up. Somebody, I think I was on, saw it on Facebook one day. Lord, give me coffee to change the things I can change and wine to accept the things I can't. But you know, the serenity prayer that is the um, mainstay of 12-step um, programs. God, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think, you know, in, in hospice and as we work with patients and families, uh, change the things you can. That It's not uh, wrong to want to be in control. Pain control, we want that. Control who you want visiting with you, who you want to be with you when you're dying, where you want to die control those things you can control, but things we can't control, like the inevitability of our death, give me the serenity to accept those things, but the courage to change the things I can, and then the wisdom to know the difference. Again, Viktor Frankl talked about this. He coined the phrase, the last of the human freedoms. He writes, man, woman can preserve a vestige of spiritual freedom, of independence of mind, even in such terrible conditions as psychic and physical stress. Everything can be taken from a man, from a woman, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. In the final analysis, it becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of camp influences alone. And I can add to this, not the result of cancer or Alzheimer's or divorce or whatever it is we feel is making us miserable. It's our inner decision. And it's this spiritual freedom which cannot be taken away that makes life meaningful and purposeful. You start seeing this stuff everywhere. I was in uh, Boston for a meeting and walked across the Boston Common and saw this statue and it's of Wendell Phillips who was an abolitionist. And on his uh, statue there, it says, whether in chains or in laurels, liberty knows nothing but victories. And let me quote another thing from Eddie Hillison. This is the last thing we know that she wrote is a postcard that she wrote on the train heading to Auschwitz. Um, 
she wrote this postcard. She stuck it through the slats of the boxcar where she was riding. It was picked up by somebody in a farmer's field probably and posted to her friend, Christine. And um, these are the last words we have from her that um, she wrote to Christine. She said, Christine, opening the Bible at random, I find this, the Lord is my high tower. I am sitting in the, on my rucksack in the middle of a full freight car. Father, mother, and my brother are a few cars away. In the end, the departure came without warning on sudden orders from the Hague. We left the camp singing. And I think, you know, how do people, knowing they're going to their death, left the camp singing? And if I hadn't seen over these years of working with people who are dying, people I've seen in my own family going through death, and dying and know that it can be done with a great deal of serenity. Um, I wouldn't have thought that was possible, but it is possible. And I know people can do it and uh, they do it every day, which is really the ultimate of letting go of control at the end of life. So I'm gonna stop talking and listen to you talk some. I'll be glad to give feedback if you got questions or comments, but I, I welcome, what's your experience been with the spiritual and emotional issues at the end of life? Susan? Thank you so very much, Hank. And I'm, I'll let people know how to raise their hand. And I just wanna say, um, I was really moved by your talk, so thank you so much. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand to ask a question here, um, please note that um, it's likely that you would be, uh, you're gonna be recorded, this is being recorded. We'll post this on our YouTube channel. If you don't want your face or your image used, then please do just turn off your camera. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand so that I can track your questions, if you go to either the participant icon or the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen, depending on your version of Zoom, the raised hand icon will be one in one or the other places. And if you use that uh, raised hand icon, not only do I see it on your um, image there, but I also there's a list where it will show up in the order that you're asking a question. So. Um, Please do that, and if you just absolutely can't figure that out, send a chat, and I will just call on you. Um, and um, there are a couple of questions here so uh, that I will ask, one from Santu, one of our um, folks here. Um, and somebody I see put up the clapping hand, but sadly that it does not look like it's attached to any of your <laughs> I appreciate that. Maybe thank you just, for that clap. Just, yes, thank you for the clap. But if I, you I like assume to, that's for me or Susan. That's I'm for you. Sure. That's for you. Oh, okay. um, that you just want to use the participant button, or if you're using under reactions, there is a clapping hand, and just underneath that clapping hand, it will say raise hand. So if you meant to raise your hand, that's how you can do it. Um, and uh, so a couple of things. Hey, this was just like a walk down memory lane when you um, were. Quoting Stephen Levine, of course, is my um, mentor and my dear friend. Yeah, hey, I know. I put up his, um, one of the things that Stephen would talk a lot about, of course, in his workshops and in his books was this idea of suffering. One of the most useful um, sort of guidance I've ever had about suffering was him saying to us that, you know, we, pain is not optional. We live in a body, we have a mind, we have an emotional life, you know, getting through this life without experiencing pain, either physical or emotional pain is quite almost impossible. Um, suffering is how we respond to that pain. You know, for some of us, we just push it away. We don't want that to be the case. We don't want that to be what's happening. And all of this effort is gone into trying to hold this off or sort of, I, I relate to it as sort of holding off a wall of water. Like it's not possible, but we're gonna expend our time and energy trying to, to do that. And so many people I've seen at the end of life um, including my own mother, whose death anniversary was on Friday, at the very end, through a life of suffering in the last 10 days of her life, she was able to give that all up and put down these very rigid hands 
And I'm sorry, I didn't realize that my camera is off here. Um, put down these hands that kept life out like this her whole entire life. And she was able to embrace her life at the end of it. And I don't know if that's because she did know she was dying. Um, we don't really know what prompted that, but it really, she just let go of all of that anger and resentment and um, pain that she carried in her own life and hadn't been able to put down. And so um, when I'm thinking about people at end of life and making decisions around end of life, I feel like in our own family, we were very lucky that um, the year before she told us what her wishes were, but more importantly, she told us what she absolutely did not want, which was very helpful in sort of navigating what the last 10 days of her life looked like. And um, Kathleen Singh was on the faculty, Frank Ustetsi spoke with us last month, or actually in, in December, and um, he had a, a beautiful training that was available for years. And Kathleen was on the staff of that training. And so we got to know her pretty well. And uh, she's just, she was lovely. She was going to be doing a talk for us. And then she died rather unexpectedly. So um, the couple of comments here that um, people are sending is um, one is from one chaplain to another. Thank you. This is an excellent presentation. And somebody asked, said, could you please ask King to show two particular slides that are not in the handouts, the photo of the evolution of man, not from Neanderthals, and also the slide of the documentary Into the Night. We actually showed the film Into the Night uh, last year as part of our um, movie series, and it was very well received. I recommend it highly, and I believe you can see it streaming online. And if I do not forget to do this, I will include this on our um, I'll include this in our uh, resource. The um... I'm gonna, I'll see if I can get that slide real quickly. They asked for. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm scrolling back through my slides real quick here. Where was that guy? Um, yeah, I got the. I can't remember where I. Got, maybe it was Wikipedia. I'm not a. I'm not a, a scientist to. Um, okay, now I gotta go back to you guys and share this. Can I share the screen again? I think I can. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, so the 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 point is is that Homo sapiens of of these the gene. Uh, can't remember its genus or species. Well, the genus, I guess, Homo sapiens is our species. Um, the Neanderthals were over here, and uh, of course, you, you read some scientists that there actually is some was some interbreeding between mm -hmm. our ancestors, the Homo sapiens. The the point why I, this is even in my lecture was that there is evidence that the Neanderthals had a sense of life after death that they buried their dead with implements. There is uh, others, scientists say no, that this is no proof that they buried their dead with um, uh, rituals. So again, I'm not gonna try to solve that one. Uh, we do know um, humans uh, probably 100,000 years ago were burying their dead with rituals and um, Oh no, let that go. Um, so it goes way back, and it's not yes. obviously not just um, in in the Abrahamic religions, um, Judaism, Christianity, uh, Islam, um, but the idea of of of, of life after death uh, is very prevalent. And as I said, of uh, that uh, survey that even. Atheists and agnostics mm -hmm. believe in living after death. So I, I, the, whoever asked that about the Neanderthal, that's that's my point of of sharing that. And I, it's again, I'm not the scientist. I, I don't know um, to be able to explain all that. I just I just know there are some scientists who said they buried their dead with rituals. That that's the point. Yes. Thank you. And rituals, uh, by the way, whether you're religious or not, ritual, rituals are so important. Yes. And I think this time of COVID has uh, forced us to think 
outside the box, so to speak, of rituals because you know your standard funeral where you have a wake and people come and they hug your neck and they say how sorry they are we can't do that right now um and my my mother-in-law died last year um in in september and and then her hometown she lived in forever and where my wife had grown up and had friends and her brother brothers and sister had grown up and uh, the brother and sister still live there and there had there would there have been a normal funeral it was a catholic funeral mm -hmm. there would have been hundreds of people that would have come to the funeral and the the wake and reception and all that kind of stuff we had a funeral we did have a church funeral for family only yeah. and they live streamed it on facebook and recorded it for us and so the rituals are so important to be able to do that and and people are finding other ways and in my years of hospice and nursing home um you know people are not even religious rituals are important um the 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 deathbed vigil where you sit around and i would ask families tell me about old joe what, what was he like what was his favorite joke you know, and and um, of course, me as a chaplain, kind of in my um, toolkit, is to offer a prayer, which is an important ritual. But maybe if you're not a praying type person, let's just sit here in silence together. Um, so um, you can make up your own rituals. It doesn't have to be a traditional religious one. Um, but some way of acknowledging the passing uh, of the person. Thank you, Hank. Um, we have another question here from our own Rachel Rosenberg. She is one of our spiritual counselors. Uh, she's actually the manager of the spiritual care department. And her question is, how do you respond uh, as a chaplain when a patient asks uh, or says that they're just afraid of dying? They're afraid of dying. And how do you respond to that? Well, of course, ask them, um, you know, what, what, what are you afraid of? Now, they might have some um, physical reason. You know, they might say, I'm afraid of choking to death. And that's a very legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, of, of assuring them we're going to do everything we can to clear your airway, to ease your pain. Um, I think a lot of people might not be afraid of being dead, but they're afraid of the dying process, what that's going to be like. So pain. Now, there are people that are afraid of the existential question is, you know, what's going to happen to me after I die? Mm -hmm. um, and then as a, as a chaplain, of course, we have to explore, you know, what their own background is. Um, and for traditional Christians, uh, which is, of course, my background, um, would be easier to explain it. But maybe if they're from another religion, maybe finding someone from their own religion to help them with, um, you know, their, their uh, fear of dying. But bottom line is, is of course, you're going to have to ask, them, what is it? What are you afraid of? And uh, uh, how can I, as chaplain, help alleviate that? So it could be, you know, any of those other things. I mean, it could be, uh, uh, I, I want to reconcile to my brother. Um, if I die, I, that that's not going to happen. So mm -hmm. it's not an easy answer. And, and some people do die afraid. Not a lot. I've, this is one of the Kathleen Singh's um, thesis in her book, is we all go through this spiritual process at the end of life, no matter religion or not. You go through this letting go of the self and um, uh, like, like go, finally let go of that self at the end. A great book, by the way, it's a real short novella by Leo Tolstoy, The Death of Ivan Illich. And, and he, this was written, uh, I think, in 1880, something like that. Um, 
he just nails it of the struggle of someone getting to the finally getting to the end and getting beyond their fear of death and uh with when the the family around them the doctor everybody else is denying that the patient's dying and the patient knows it's it's a great 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 book yes um Hank, there's somebody else just in terms of this conversation that you're having now. One of the um, one of our folks says uh, that they, they have no microphone, but is saying that her daddy was slowly going downhill in the hospital. And he told her that he was ready to go to his mansion on the streets of gold. Her, his job now was to prepare me for when he was gone and to learn to let go. Mm. Just to share that. Yeah, yeah that's pretty beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and one of the things, I mean, my one of my hopes here as the director of community education is that by engaging, by, like creating spaces where people can engage in these kinds of conversations and be thoughtful about their approach and um, get information about things that are important to us um, while we're living, um, even while we're approaching death or when we're supporting somebody else in their approach to death, is that we have opportunities long before the deathbed to have these conversations and to think about these things. And um, on Tuesday, I was talking with a dear, dear friend of mine who just turned 94. It was his 94th birthday. And almost every phone call we've had for the 20 years that I've known him um, has been about about people that he knows that have died, you know, and he just said, when you get to a certain point, do they, they made him a legend at Preservation Hall jazz uh, place, because he's played there. But he also said, if you outlive everybody else, then you also just become a legend. Um, <laughs> and, you know, this conversation that we have, it made me think so much about this, this kind of this culture that we live in, which is all about accumulating things about, you know, titles and jobs and belongings and cars and houses and all of these things that, you know, we're kind of trained that these are important things. These are the things that you need. And so we spend our the first half of our life, you know, in relationship and having children and just, you know, collecting houses and cars and things that we need to, you know, be good uh, citizens here. And then we spend the whole second half of our life having to let go of every single one of those things, because that's the reality is that, you um, no matter how hard my beloved friend protested on his deathbed, that he just really couldn't take all the things that he worked so hard to accumulate with him, and it really pissed him off. Um, and that's also just true. And so to try to engage in these practices of letting go in smaller ways, letting go of your beloved is the hardest letting go, but to practice in smaller ways as a kind of practice, really, to the time where we have to let go of things that are much more difficult and much harder. And so I really appreciate this. This. Um, uh, let, me, let me tell you a story, uh, another story about my dad, related exactly to what you're talking about uh, there, Susan. Um, yes. Dad collected Florida memorabilia, you know, mm -hmm. newspaper articles. He had files and files and files of newspaper articles, organized, you know, you could find things photographs he, he bought and found old photographs he had 10,000 florida postcards and he they had they built an extra room on the house where i grew up just to hold all his stuff and my brother and sister and i were just feared for what's going to happen with all this stuff when dad yes. dies and fortunately uh he had the idea of seeing if the university of south florida would be interested in putting it in. They had a special collections of Florida stuff, and they were. They came out and looked at it and said, yes, we do want it. Wow. And for tax purposes, um, they had it appraised, and it was over $200,000 worth of, of um, material that was to go to the university after Dad died. But Dad, with the strokes and the Parkinson's, couldn't do his research anymore, couldn't look at all this stuff, couldn't type, couldn't write. And so he's still at home and he tells mom, he says, call the university and tell them come they can come take the stuff. And so they came with the truck and they boxed everything up and took things out. And one time at the nursing home, I, was, I asked dad, I said, dad, what was it like for you when they took all your life's work out the door and put it on the truck? And he started to cry. He broke down. He said, it's the hardest thing I ever did. And I, now this is a guy, his own father died when he was 10 years old. He grew up in the depression. 
he he served in Europe in World War II. Uh, he had a he had a son die at age seven days in 1954. He raised three teenagers through the 60s, and that was me and my brother and sister. And the hardest thing he ever did was letting go of that stuff. But it turned out to be a wonderful gift for him because they took the stuff and they digitized it. Mm -hmm. And now you can go to the University of South Florida Special Collections, the Hampton Dunn Collection, and download photos, postcards, and things he saved over the years. Wow. And he was able to see that. And it, it turned out to be a great gift to himself to see his life's work go on for generations. And people all over the world were now downloading his stuff. So anyhow, I, I, my dad, I'll tell you, I, I, just because I've told a couple stories about him, I mean, I learned about preparing for death from him because he, he did it so, so well. Yeah. Yes, I think there's so much that we can learn. As Elizabeth Cougar Ross reminded us again and again, the dying have so much to teach the living. And for me personally, I've just been so grateful. Um, thank you, Gigi. Yes, I realized that too. So I'm going to stop typing. I'm just going to put this link up. This is the link to um, Hank's father's collection that's on the um, oh, University of Southern Florida. Yeah, you could. Uh, the, yes, it's right there. Um, you know, to get these opportunities to, this is one of the great gifts, I think, of hospice volunteers, uh, is that they get an opportunity to be with other people that are dying, and they get to say, oh, yes, or oh, no, and just to kind of see how other people are navigating that space, and um, you know, I just learned so much from working with volunteers and uh, also from seeing patients, um, just so much about um, the wide variety of ways people leave this world and the ones that seem to be able to go as unburdened as is possible are people that really have given um, some thought to this and just kind of laid their burden down and uh, went for, it's, I, I, I think of these people as the people that just get on the ride and strap on their seat belts and they're kind of like, we're going to go on this ride. And it may not be the ride they want to go on, but they're willing to um, let go of this idea that we have to be in control of all of this because at a certain point in time, it becomes clear that there's not much that we're going to be in control of here. So the one thing we can be in control of is how are we going to approach this? And I heard a beautiful share at one of our author series um, last week by one of our community members talking about it, her husband's death and the grief that came after that, and that she made a very clear decision that she was going to feel everything, to allow everything, and to navigate this in a way that would allow her to grow as much as a person as was possible, which I think is a tremendous decision to make when you're just so bereft. But that was kind of I think of value in their family that whatever situation came up, what can we learn from this and how can we um, live our best lives um, given whatever's going on. And so that this ability to take, make decisions about these things that, you know, being diagnosed with an illness and approaching death doesn't mean you're just swept completely away. But the way that we can um, talk about these things and think about them can really be impactful. And yes, thank you. Um, Joanna, yes, please do go ahead, unmute yourself if you would like and share. And if you are okay, if I can see you, I can find you when you've unmuted yourself. If you're okay, I will put you um, on the camera if you're okay with that. So go ahead and unmute. Joanna, are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, probably not. One second. You cannot. <laughs> now you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have enjoyed this. Joanna, we can't hear you. Could you either move closer to your microphone? Okay. I'm here now. Beautiful. I'm present. Um, so I've enjoyed this tremendously. Um, I, uh, I'm actually in the middle of COVID right now. I've got a, got a touch of COVID, but my whole uh, attitude is um, this too shall pass, et cetera. I wanted to share um, my mother's gift to us um, just before she died. She, um, she said, just a minute, I'm coming. And, and we, we had the wonderful... Um, uh, imagining of, of all kinds of um, 
you know, saints, Mother Mary, angels, uh, ascended masters. My mother was a, just a beautiful soul. Well, she is still a beautiful soul. Uh, and, uh, and we loved her a lot. Um, the other thing that was, um, that impressed us is that, well, she was uh, at that time in a nursing home, but the, her posture on dying, it was as if her body, it was as if uh, her spirit just swept up uh, toward, toward heaven. Uh, her arm went way up and she was looking like this. It, it, seemed, it seemed just very um, relevant to, to her last words, you know. So anyway, we're, we're just really grateful for, for that. Um, yeah. That sounds like a great gift she gave you. Absolutely. It, yeah. And I, I like to share it with other people in case they may not have heard something like that. Mm -hmm. I know you must have heard a lot. In fact, Hank, I, I would still like to become a chaplain yet in my life. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a, um, a great book called Final Gifts written by two hospice nurses. It's gosh, it's 25 years old, something like that. And basically they, they go through telling stories exactly like you just told us <clears throat> about things patients say, dying people say. And um, um, uh, uh, one common theme is, is seeing people coming for them. I'm coming or I've got to get on the train. Uh, I've got to pack my bags. So it's, it's not unusual to have these experiences. Um, and you, you take it as a great gift. Um, not all deaths are like that. Uh, some people just die and no last words or no nothing like that. Um, but uh, you're, you're very fortunate. Uh, that sounds like it meant a lot to you. It means a lot to you. It's, it hasn't gone. So. It does. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Joanna. Um, a couple of other things here people have put in the chat. Sandy says, the five remembrances of the Buddha is a great way to remind yourself of the process of letting be. Also, Joan Roshi, Halifax's meditation on the stages of death and the dissolution of the body in her book, Being With Dying. Yes, I recommend that highly, like my mentor, Stephen Levine, who talked about the different um, different uh, sort of stages of the body and the process of death going from the very solid to sort of the liquid to the gaseous, like this dissolution of the body um, always has fascinated me. And yes, Maggie Callahan's book, Final Journeys, and the second book, Final Journeys, touches on the same topic. Final, final, final gifts. Final Gifts. I think she's got a second book, though, called Final Journeys, maybe. The first okay. one is Final Gift, for sure. It is. Yes. Um, and so, Hank, I'm looking at the time, and it's three. It's 2.34. And um, so I'm going to thank you so very much today for the beautiful talk you gave to us. And um, I'm so grateful. I am going to um, just say a couple of things about the ending. For folks that are here, you'll be receiving an evaluation uh, very soon with some resources, and I hope I've gotten them all on there. Um, and if not, just email me, and I will send them to you. And uh, we... We'll, I'll also send a list of our upcoming events, and please know that if you live in our service area in San Mateo or northern Santa Clara County, have any concerns about end of life or your own journey through illness um, or your loved ones, do you can call us, you can email me, and we will do what we can to support you. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Hank, and I am going to stop the recording right now. Um, and thank you all. <laughs>